with Christ. Knowing that we have been forgiven by Christ should release the generosity that is required to forgive others. To not forgive others shows that we don't really understand Christ's forgiveness of us. To resist forgiving others means that we don't really understand how bad our own sin is and the cost that Christ paid to secure our forgiveness for us. Jesus was literally crucified. He was tortured. He was whipped. He had a crown of thorns put on his head and a rod was taken to beat him to give us forgiveness. We don't really understand sometimes what that cost was. But this happens often. Someone, someone refuses to forgive, even though the other person seeks forgiveness or extends forgiveness. But someone else's refusal to forgive does not take away our own responsibility. We cannot blame our inaction on someone else. We are responsible to live out God's word, even if someone else doesn't, even if that someone else is a Christian. See, each of us are called to forgive, not based on, on someone else's action, but based on Christ's action. We are to forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. So to live out this practice of forgiveness is to live out the gospel. Christ's citizens dress a certain way, and Christ's citizens act a certain way. How do we dress and act? Are we as different as different can be? The culmination of these two verses arrives in verse 14. Verse 14. It says, And above all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Above all these, meaning don't stop there. Move, move beyond this to put on love. See, often we believe that love is to be the foundation of all of this. But no, the foundation, like we covered earlier, is Christ. Because of Christ, we put on a new self. Because of Christ, we forgive. And now, because of Christ, we, we put on love. This love is the same love that we mentioned earlier as we are God's beloved. It is the agape love. It is the complete, all-encompassing, sacrificing for, never giving up love of God. Christ-like love functions as the greatest of the virtues and, and leads to perfection, perfection and maturity. It bonds not only the other virtues, but also the community in which they are displayed. See, Christ-like love sacrifices our own interests out of concern for the welfare of others. And it's the quality above all else that is necessary for our new nature. It is the super glue of church unity. Love is like putting on an emblem. You know, like Superman, he rips open his shirt and you see the emblem for the S emblem for Superman. Love is our emblem. It is the overarching element of everything else. Christ's citizens are marked by love. It's our third point for today. Christ's citizens are marked by love. See, the previous two verses builds into our understanding of this point. First, Christ's citizens dress a certain way. See, love is the stitching that holds the, the citizens' clothes together. The list of attributes that we must put on uh, are singularly focused on building and maintaining a community characterized by love. Secondly, Christ's citizens act a certain way. Love is the motivation for the citizens' actions. See, in a community of love, forgiveness is a critical element. Forgiveness demonstrates grace, which creates unity in Christ, and it eliminates the barriers that just separate believers. The foundation is Christ. The culmination of these three verses is love. Christ's citizens are marked by love. Some Christians are hard to love, though, sometimes, aren't they? Now, no, none of us are going to be like, because we all know each other, right? But sometimes Christians are hard to love. Sometimes Christians refuse to dress or act like Christ citizens, or, you know, at least they're just not very far along in their process of changing. Some Christians are not very different from their old selves. What do we do 
when a Christian is obstinate, when they're difficult? How do we approach even, you know, arguments within the body of Christ? Well, look at verse 15 with me. It says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. See, this word rule also means arbitrate, literally to act as umpire. This is the same word that we talked about in chapter 2 of not letting someone disqualify us. Here it is used to, to talk about the peace of Christ. It describes the activity of the umpire in the games who decides the contest. This is an imperative in the Greek, meaning that Paul is very forceful here. The peace of Christ is to make the call in arbitrating a conflict. Peace must direct us. It must control us. It must rule us. Membership in the one body of Christ involves a call to maintain peace among believers. Christ citizens are ruled by the peace of Christ. That is our fourth point today. Christ citizens are ruled by the peace of Christ. See, the goal of the costly attributes that we are to put on in love and the costly activity of Christ-like forgiveness is that Christ's peace would rule our relationships. But what is the peace of Christ? Let me first tell you what it is not. See, Paul is writing this letter in a particular context. The Colossians are living in the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire, um, all scholars, even secular scholars talk about this. The Roman Empire had something called the Pax Romana. Pax means peace, Romana means Rome. The Pax Romana means the peace of Rome. The peace of Rome was enforced by the military. It was a peace imposed on others, and it was maintained through fear. If someone did something wrong, they could expect punishment by some of the soldiers. The rule of Rome was a peace maintained through fear and violence. But the rule of Christ's peace is quite different. See, secured by his blood on the cross, Christ's peace is one of self-sacrifice. It is maintained through love. Instead of fear and, and threats, Christ's peace is marked by love and encouragement. Instead of betraying each other, we bear with one another and we forgive one another. See, this peace isn't a forceful removal of conflict as under the peace of Rome. But it, it centers ourselves in knowing that Christ is in control. The peace of Christ removes the need to, to manipulate others or, or to fear others' opinions, and it enables a culture of, of reconciliation to flourish within the body of Christ. The peace of Christ is the opposite of the peace of Rome. It is as different as different can be. Christ's citizens are ruled by the peace of Christ. And verse 15 ends with, and be thankful. I always love this. It's just after a whole long list of things, Paul's like, and you know what? Be thankful. If he could summarize everything together, it's and be thankful. See, this too is an imperative. This too is forceful language from Paul. But there's no qualifiers. There's no person. There's no gift. There's no situation to be thankful for. He just simply urges us to be thankful. Thankfulness should mark our being. Gratitude should describe our new nature. It should be core to our, our identity as a church, as a, as a body of believers. Thanksgiving develops the awareness that every gift is from him. And so it, it, it deals a blow to just our prideful attitudes of our old selves. Gratitude is a love for the giver of all good things. It allows for forgiveness and peace. We as Christ citizens are to be thankful to God in everything that we do. Because he alone is the source of all goodness. See, this, this body of believers, this community, this, this church, this kingdom of God, kingdom of Christ's citizens, is different from the world. 
We were brought into this community through Christ's blood, through baptism, after the gift of salvation, and we dress and we act opposite of who we once were. Love is our emblem. The peace of Christ is our rule, and we are marked by gratitude. This leads to our big idea for today. Christ, sorry, citizens chosen live in community like chosen citizens. Citizens chosen who are holy and beloved, we live in community like we are holy and beloved. Citizens chosen live in community like chosen citizens. We're beloved by God, so we should look like it. We should act like it. To, to do anything else would be just counterintuitive. So how do we live like chosen citizens? Well, again, first we dress a certain way. Uh, a, a way that is different from who we were. We, we choose compassion over ignoring pain. We are kind instead of surface level nice. We are humble instead of proud. We are meek instead of insisting on our own opinions. And, and we are patient instead of rash. Second, we act a certain way. We bear with each other's shortcomings, and we forgive. And I could, I could spend, and I probably should spend the rest of my life encouraging all Christians for, in here and throughout the world to just forgive. Freely we have received, so freely we should give. And next we are marked by love. We should be known by our love. Love is speaking truth, and it is showing grace. And finally, we are ruled by peace. Do we want to respond in anger? Pause and give a, a calm, reasoned response, or, or even step away for a moment and, and cool down. Could, could a compromise be made, or could we, could we give way to someone else while still upholding the truth? Let's do it. Let's, let's be known for voluntary peace and not forcing domineering peace. In other words, let's be ruled by the peace of Christ. And here's how we practically live this out in this moment of time. So each point of application, again, will just address who we are as a body of believers, because that's how Paul is writing this uh, letter. He's addressing a body of believers. So first, we should actively help each other. Make it a point to know when someone is sick. Know, know uh, who is going through a surgery, ha has had a, a, a child, or even recently lost a loved one. See, having a compassionate heart would see us reaching out to those people, praying with them, offering to bring over a meal. When you hear of someone struggling in the body, the kindness that we put on would spur us to, to start thinking about how we could respond generously. Are there not parents with young ones who could use a date night? Is there not someone in this body who uh, we could bless in the spring by mowing their lawn? I was going to say shoveling their, their you know, driveway, but... Where's the snow, right? Are there not homebound or nursing homebound members who would love a visit from us? Actively help others. Next, is there tension between you and a fellow believer? Pray about it. Pray that God would grow humility and meekness and patience in, in us. That he would expose our faults and our areas that we need to repent. Because I'm sure... Many of us, um, I do this sometimes, we, we give much thought to the failings of the other person. But we should turn our judgment inward and seek God's grace for others. And forgive. Forgiveness is so important. Forgive. Forgive each other. Forgive past wrongs. Forgive present hurts. Forgive generously. Sometimes we like to hold on to wrongs for too long, far too long. You know, the IRS doesn't make us keep our, uh, our, tax re our receipts for taxes um, past seven years. Why do we hold on to sins for much longer? Why do we hold on to someone else's sin for much longer? Forgive each other. Even if the person doesn't forgive you, take that step in faith. Do it not because the other person deserves it, but because the Lord forgave you. See, the Lord forgave you when you were your old self. The Lord forgave you before you changed. Why would we require a person to change or to have merit before we forgive? Forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And lastly, if there is ever an argument or a disagreement that ever comes up, let the peace of Christ 
rule in that situation. First, pray for God's direction. Seek God's understanding to see if the conflict resides in ourselves first. And then go to the person and talk to them. Knowing that no matter the outcome, your salvation and the other person's salvation is still secure in Christ. The disagreement is not bigger than God. So abide in his peace. When things are as different as different can be, we call them opposites. Now do you see? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement, Lord, that is in it. We thank you for the direction that you give us on, and what our new selves look like in you. I especially praise you, Lord, that, that we are your chosen ones, that we are holy, that we are loved by you, that that is what our identity is. That is the identity of everyone who puts their faith in you. And we thank you for that, Lord. Your love changes us. And so help us in this process of change. Continue to mature us to make us look more like Christ, to grow spiritually in depth, that it would change our thoughts, our behaviors, our attitudes, and our actions. And Lord, that as we change, that we would encourage others and spur each other on towards that change. Help us, Lord, to uh, have an a environment of grace here as you are growing it, and I have seen it in here already. Continue to grow that in us, Lord. Help us to put on these attributes. Help us to act as you would have us act to forgive each other. And Lord, let us be ruled by your peace. And as we go forth from today, Lord, as you change us, I pray that you would uh, also uh, uh, give us courage to share uh, the good news of Christ with others. Help us, Lord, to uh, let others know that your love is so great and it, uh, it is for them as well. Guide us as we go throughout this week. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join me in singing for him.